Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAS YouTube channel. And this is part of the good stuff. This is the AAS Journal author series. And I am super happy to have Petra Mengistu and Karen Masters with us today. Hey, Petra. Hey, Karen. Hey. Hello. Well, first of all, thank you very much for being to talk about your very lovely research note. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, let's start with Petra. Petra, where are you located at? What's your geolocation? Hi, I'm currently at Haverford College in Philadelphia, in Philadelphia Pennsylvania. Philly. All right. Awesome. Uh, it is March 23rd as we do this recording, so we're a little past Equinox. Um, is there still snow on the ground in Philly or is spring in the air? Spring's definitely in the air. A little rainy today, but it's been in the air for the past few days. Very cool. Uh, so I'm in Phoenix, and we definitely got a little extra winter blast yesterday. We were getting rain and cold. It was down into the like 50s or something. And I know that's well, maybe warm, but um, Phoenix, it was cold. Uh, so I'm still looking forward to spring truly coming to Phoenix. Uh, and Karen, you must be in the same. Yes, that's right. Oh, yes, I'm, sure. I'm just in the next building over from Petra right now. Ah, very good. Mm -hmm. uh, and Petra, what is what is your position there uh, at Haverford? Where, how, where are you along? I'm currently a junior at Haverford. Very yeah. nice. Very nice. So we get to graduate in a year and a half. Yay. Very good. Cool. Exciting. All right. Uh, and uh, Petra, what do you like to do for research currently and possibly in the future? Hmm. Hi. I'm really interested in galaxies, which is why I work with Professor Karen Masters. Um, and I'm interested in optical astronomy generally observational astronomy as well. So I really like well, looking at images of galaxies and also looking at different catalogs and relating galaxy features. Nice. And Karen, what do you like to do for research? Yeah, that all sounds good to me. Um, so <laughs> generally, generally I study galaxies using data from surveys of different kinds. I kind of, I like optical. I also have a fondness for radio astronomy, the 21 centimeter line. Yes. Um, I'm working with citizen scientists. So Petra's project that we're talking about is an example of that where we're, we've used a bit of information from Galaxy Zoo, which is something I've been um, involved with for a long time. Yeah, yeah, very cool, um, very cool. Looking at how shapes and structures in galaxies affect how they behave. And... Thanks. And that is gonna bring us to this very awesome Research note, it's open access people. You can go get a copy, grab one for free. Mass and color dependence of the Hubble spiral sequence and Petra and Karen takes us away. Great, thank you, Frank. So just to start with a quick overview, this research note focuses on the relationship between arm winding and spiral galaxies and bulge size. So we generally have different types of galaxy morphology and we've used the Hubble classification scheme as the central starting point for that where Hubble where it classifies galaxies into different categories namely spiral galaxies and elliptical galaxies and spiral galaxies are further subdivided into barred and unbarred and also ordered in terms of increasing arm windiness or how tightly round spiral arms are okay cool so we have that um Generally, spiral arms are ordered in increasing tightly wound arms. And an assumption that's been made from the Hubble classification scheme, looking at the galaxies that are classified together is that increasingly tightly wound spiral arms also have increasingly large bulge size or centrally concentrated masses. Okay. And our models of spiral arm formation, namely the classic static density wave model tends to provide further evidence for this assumption where more tightly wound spiral arms are predicted to form in centrally concentrated mass regions. I'm just gonna jump in and say, it's almost sort of backwards, right? Because Hubble saw this thing that tightly wound arms came with big bulges and the density wave, the static density wave model could explain that everyone really liked the dense static density wave model for a long time. Jumped on it, yeah. 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 But Very cool. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, so there has been a lot of evidence that there it, there's a great diversity in spiral galaxy morphologies. So the Hubble classification scheme isn't necessarily comprehensive of all of the morphologies that we observe. 
which has also called into question the static density wave model as not everything that we see is necessarily supported by the Hubble classification scheme. Fair enough. Good. Thank you. Um, and using a volume sam limited sample of galaxies, Professor Masters and the Galaxy Zoo team plotted, looked, observed the relationship between arm winding and bulge size and found that there was no significant correlation. Okay. So in this research note, we try to understand how, how exactly spiral arm winding and bulge size are related in different samples of spirals that are separated by global properties of mass and color. Okay. Right. So to do that, we based our sample in the same sample as Masters et al. in 2019, where we used responses and morphologies developed from the Galaxy Z2 survey. And we selected also volume limited sample at low redshift with redshift less than 0 0.035. And we imposed a mass limit of the logarithmic ratio of stellar mass to solar mass of nine. Okay. Mm -hmm. We also, yes, thank you. Um, we also required that our sample had to comprise of galaxies that were in fact spiral galaxies and were also not edge on so that we could in fact determine whether the spiral galaxies were tightly round, medium round, or loosely round. And to do that, we use the Dubai's foot fractions, which are represented by the variable P and the primary response denoted as a subscript. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm with you. Thank you. Um, and we imposed the restrictions that 43% of the participants had to report seeing features in the galaxy, 71.5% had to report seeing that they were not edge on, and 50% had to report seeing that they were spiral galaxies. Uh, okay, I'm with you. Got it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And to make quantitative comparisons between arm winding and bulge size, we used the previously defined arm winding score and bulge prominence score defined in the Masters et al. 2019 paper. And to do that, we define the arm winding score as the weighted sum of the Dubai's foot fractions of participants that noted seeing the spiral arms as medium tightly wound and fully tightly wound. <coughs> Excuse me. And we define the bulge prominence score as 20% of the participants who saw the bulge as just noticeable, 80% of participants who reported seeing the bulge as obvious, and all of the participants who reported seeing the bulge as dominant. I love oh. obvious bulges. Okay, sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just jump in here and say this is a way of taking where in Galaxy Zoo we have more than two answers um, to a question. This is a way of putting that onto a single scale that goes from zero to one. Um, so we're kind of treating, you know, we had three answers about arm winding score, but we'd like to have a single number that captures what everyone said in those three answers. And and likewise, oh. for bulge size um, in Galaxy Zoo, there's four different answers. And so, yeah. Oh, right. Yeah, right. Okay. So this is the citizen science aspect coming in, right? And so you will get um, yeah. diversity of classifications. And this is accommodating that. Yeah, but if you kind of look at this and you think if everyone said they saw tightly wound spirals, you, that would be your winding score would be one. Got and it. if everyone said they saw loosely wound spirals, if you look at that equation, the winding score would be zero. And so it just puts that on a, whereas, you know, if it's all mixed up, maybe it's medium is a good choice and it's in the middle. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. I'm with you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And just to add on to that a little, the coefficients are arbitrary, but as Karen said, they do range from zero to one. And there were also the choices that were right. calibrated against other measures of pitch angle and bulge size for another subset of galaxies and they were shown to have good internal validity. Okay, great. <laughs> Excuse me. So to divide our sample into the four subsets of mass and color, we used NUVR color and stellar mass using the NASA Sloan Atlas catalog. And we used the threshold of NUVR equals four, where greater than four is red and less than four is blue. And the mass threshold of a ratio of 10.3, which was motivated by the point at which we transfer from the blue cloud to the red sequence okay. from MS galaxies. Yep, cool. Okay. Yeah, okay. We'll figure with that. Okay. Thank you. So yeah, as this is your research note, all of our results are sort of contained in this one figure. <laughs> one figure. <laughs> yes, yes. 
Um, so sort of to just go through each portion of the figure, I'll start by explaining the images on the rightmost and leftmost panels, which also link into understanding the arm winding score a little bit more. So in the galaxies that are outlined in the pink slash red and cyan box, we have low mass galaxies. So just a little bit to throw. Thank you. Yes. Um, and on the upper region, we have a um, galaxy that appears to have tightly wound arms, and that also corresponds to a galaxy with large arm winding. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. In the lower region, we have galaxies that are, are observed to have low, uh, li, sorry, <laughs> low winding scores, and they also appear to have the least tightly wound arms. So that would be just above, and still okay. in the cyan box, but the okay. lower. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. So we're an example. Here's a tight and here's yeah, less. Okay, yes. gotcha. And we have that same relationship for the high mass galaxies, which are outlined in the blue and the orange boxes, where okay. tightly wound spiral arms also have large winding scores and less tightly wound spirals have least tightly wound spiral, mm -hmm. lower winding scores. Yep. Okay, cool. Zoom. And so oh. you explain like upper the upper bit is low mass and the lower bit is high mass and then also the the, the sort of reddish colors and bluish colors are the red and blue samples. So we got some red spirals there. Oh, okay, I'm with you. Yeah, got blue it. Spirals. That's still coding. Okay, good. Okay, wonderful. And we also have the histogram shown in the upper middle panel and the side panels of the mm -hmm. two subplots. Mm -hmm. where we plot the distributions of the arm winding score and bulge prominence score for all four subsets. Mm -hmm. And in the arm winding scores, which are shown on the right panel, where we sort of just have the repeat of the figure for both subplots, we note that they all show a similar skew towards tightly wound arms, but the massive samples, which are shown in solid lines, tend to have a higher skew towards tightly wound uh, arms. Okay, yes, I see. Uh -huh. <laughs> And for the bulge prominence score, which is the histogram on the upper panel, we have that there is a notable difference between the blue low mass sample, which is given by the cyan, mm -hmm. and the, all the three other subsets, okay. where the low mass seems to be skewed towards low bulges. Okay. Yes. Okay. I'm with you. Thank you. So for the middle central okay. figure, we have the two subplots where on the upper panel, we have low mass galaxies and on the lower panel, we have high mass galaxies. Okay. And each subplot, we overplot the linear regression trend between our, the arm winding score and the bulge prominence score for blue spirals and red spirals. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, and what we can take away from this figure is that there is a clear mass and color dependence of the correlation between the two galaxy features as the relationship observed for each sample is slightly different. Okay. And among the most notable differences is that we only observe a positive relationship that was predicted by the static density wave model. Oh, cool. Okay. And the blue low mass galaxies. Mm -hmm. And all other subsets, when they're red or massive or both, show a slightly negative correlation. Okay. Mm -hmm. And this is strongest in the lower panel, and especially for the red high mass galaxies, which show the steepest negative correlation. Yes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. Nice. Very nice. Wonderful. And so relating this to our earlier discussion about the <coughs> excuse me, the Hubble spiral sequence, we think that these results aren't necessarily incompatible with the Hubble classification scheme because yeah. Hubble used photographic plates that were generally more sensitive to bluer wavelengths of light and also observed a sample of very nearby galaxies which have shown to be more low mass. Uh -huh. And we have increasingly tightly wound arms for increasing bulge size, which would be a positive correlation between arm winding and bulge size for a blue mass sample. We do in fact observe that positive relationship. Mm -hmm. But for a greater diversity of spiral arms when they are massive or redder, 
we observe that slightly negative correlation. Yeah, no, and this also explains the finding by, as shown in the Masters at All 2019 paper, of not observing a significant correlation between arm winding and bulk size because they were looking at the entire sample of galaxies. So if you superpose a slightly positive relationship and slightly negative relationships without dividing them based on mass and color, that correlation would essentially disappear. Right, right. Okay, makes sense. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and, <coughs> excuse me. So the implication of the fact that there is that mass and color dependence between the correlation of arm winding and bulge size sort of links into the fact that there might be different mechanisms of spiral arm formation rather than just one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Density wave model focused on having centrally concentrated mass and how that impacts the um how that impacts the formation of spiral arms. Yes. Would have to do that it and rather than just being focused on density waves. Spiral arm formation could be linked to tidal triggering, dynamic instability from bars, yeah. or something yeah. linked to shape. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. red massive galaxies are generally found at higher densities and have been observed to have a greater diversity of rotation curve shapes. So there may be more physical processes in regard to instability and rotation that is occurring within these galaxies. So yeah. When we treat all galaxies as the same, it sort of obscures what goes on in the physical processes behind each of the types of galaxies. So there may be multiple formation mechanisms, but depending on their physical properties. Yes, very nice. Cool. Very good. Super. Thank you. So that sort of wraps up the paper with that main takeaway of sample selection is important and especially mm -hmm physical properties for physical, the properties of formation of spiral arms have a great implication. Very cool. Nice. Like a surprising amount of my career can be summarized as sample selection is important. <laughs> <laughs> this is a nice example of it in a nice you know, research note, a nice short observational result. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Petra, Karen, thank you so much for walking us through your very lovely research note. Thank you. Um, and let me ask a little bit on where do we go with this in the future? Um, are there um, additional catalogs? Does uh, Galaxy Zoo have additional stuff coming out that you could apply to yet um, a, a larger sample size since we know sample size matters now? Um, <clears throat> uh, uh, is there more observational campaigns that could be done? Is there theoretical work that could be done? Just sort of where where do we go over the next, let's say, two to five years? And we'll start off with Petra. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, yes, I, I do think that there is definitely more examples that could be looked at now, especially there's the Galaxy Zoo decal survey or the Dark Energy ah, Camera, okay. which okay. could be another survey with has sort of deeper imaging of galaxies that could potentially provide more information about arm winding. In terms of catalogs and sort of where to take it in the citizen science project aspect, I will defer most of that to Karen. Okay. <laughs> Very cool. Karen. I think I think Petra has it. Uh, in Galaxy Zoo, we have uh, the decals classifications, which are a human machine collaboration. So we have uh, some machine learning in the loop now at Galaxy Zoo to help us go ah. faster, big surveys. Ah. Um, decals is uh, much more sensitive, so lower surface brightness and larger sky area when you include all of the different uh, surveys that they've put together. Okay. So the sample sizes can get much bigger. Um, things like LSSC uh, coming down the line um, and some you know space missions like the Nancy Roman telescope are going to also get you know morphology for much larger samples of galaxies. Um, and we could maybe look at this in the early universe with JWST or HST images. Ooh, yeah, yeah. Them. So that would be cool. Um, yeah. I think some work to do still on, you know, checking the calibration of this winding score and and, and how to best get at pitch angles and, and arm windiness. Ooh, from yeah. I think we have some work to do there too, but it's, it's good for sort of bulk categorization. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to be working pretty nicely, so. Cool. Very nice. Well, I certainly look forward to uh, 
Uh, seeing this topic advance over the next couple of years or so, it'll be really exciting. Very nice. Very nice. And Petra has to graduate. Ah. <laughs> and, and move on to her next great adventure in All Australia. right. Go Petra. All right. Awesome. Very cool. <laughs> Very good, and that will do, and I hope this made your Astronomy Day just a little bit better, and we'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye.